We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful, as always, Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And what we're going to be talking about in this session is nothing is what it seems in the therapy room. It sounds a bit Twilight Zone, this, Bob. A bit Twilight <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, it's an, it's a fascinating subject, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about it. And I was just thinking that we could say that about most things uh, in life, really. Is anything what it really seems? But as we're talking about it, particularly linked to psychotherapy and what happens in the therapy room, um, I'll talk about it specifically in that dimension. Well, so... When we look at it like that, um, what do you think, Jackie? Do you think that there's any anything that's really... Uh, will you start this one off? I've got my thoughts, but... Well, for me, I often talk about this with clients, and I'm sure I've mentioned it in past podcasts, <laughs> that, you know, in the therapy room, I've got all my baggage, and the client's got all their baggage, and there's kind of my mum and dad in there, and my grandparents are in there, literally everybody's in there. There's that aspect of it. And then also, am I being my authentic self in the therapy room? And that's up for debate, I think. Okay. So if we were thinking psychodynamically, or if we were thinking transference, and transference is the major sort of modality that underpins psychodynamic theory. Yeah. Then we would be, and I'm going to use TA language a little bit to put this across, we would be coming from a place where both therapist and client are enacting out their unconscious history or stroke script yeah. in the therapy room. Now, if we follow that through, that both people are enacting out their scripts or their unconscious past in the present, in the therapy room, aren't we really merely representations of our early history? A question mark. That's a very good question, yeah. You think? Yeah, absolutely. If It depends where I am. Yeah, I think if I'm in a good place and my state of mind is quite robust and I'm in my adult, then I'm aware of my response and reactions to things. If I'm overwhelmed or tired, then maybe not so much. <laughs> oh, so that that will mean then, Jackie, I'm fine, which I really agree with, by the way. We follow, especially if we use TA, TA language and for people listening, um, what it means when we say, you know, in our adult ego state. Uh, Eric Byrne, who was the originator of TA, talked about one way of knowing when we're in our adult ego state is that we're coming, um, when we're coming from adult ego state, we're actually presenting the age that we are, or yeah. think, believing the way we are. You know, so I'm 73, you're, I don't know your name, but you will be coming from that 73 year old rather than a different place. Yes. Yeah. Just saying that for people who perhaps what want to know what adult ego state means yes that's so what you're saying is when you're coming from your adult ego state and acting thinking and feeling as the age that you are then you will be coming from that age rather than a younger age or a regressed age or a place that you might have gone to if you were feeling overwhelmed or triggered from the transference of the client yeah so that leads us to another question which is how do you know or how do we know that we are coming from the adult ego state that we may think we're coming from at that particular time? That's a very good question. How do we know? Because I'm sure when we're not, we think we are. Well, I know for a fact, before my psychotherapy training, if somebody had asked me, how much are you in adult? I would have said 99.9% .9 of the time. I know without a shadow of a doubt that I was not and I'm not in my adult 99.9% .9 of the time. 
No, uh, uh, and I think... To me, it's being present, it's being in the moment and in the here and now and responding in two things in that moment rather than reacting. If I'm reacting to something emotionally, then I'm probably not in my adult ego state. Okay, so just throw that by me again. Will you say you said something about two things and I missed it? What did you say? I've forgotten now. Probably being being in the here and now and being present in the moment, that is where I see myself being in my adult. If I'm reacting to something, as in being emotional, then I'm probably not in my adult ego state. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. I'm clear about what you're saying now. Now, of course, one of the ways that we can perhaps, I would say make sure, but at least give us a, ourselves a fighting challenge that we're coming from adult, is that we've done a lot of therapy in ourselves and that we've done a lot of um, evaluation of our own script and that we've healed a lot of the deficits of the younger parts of ourselves so that we're able to actually stay in the moment or stay present the way you were just talking more of the time. Yeah. I think if we've done our own therapy and we can be aware of what could be the triggers back to the past, we might be likely to stay out of our script and in present time more. Yeah. What do you I, think? I think... For me, personally, I'm a lot more able to do it if I'm in a good place myself. Oh. Which is, you know, why I think it's really important as a psychotherapist that we practice self-care and that we we prioritise ourselves. Okay, so that's us talking about us as a therapist. Talk about the therapist role. Yeah. If we can come from adult, or at least the term I'm going to borrow from TA again, executive adult, yeah? Yeah. At least we are more aware of what time zone we're actually in. Yeah. Therapy process. See, I think that's the most we can do. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, yeah. we can't legislate where the client is going to come from. Now, if we're doing our job well as a therapist, one of the major goals, of course, will be to facilitate the client to visit their younger self. Or if we're thinking developmentally, much of the trauma will be in the younger self. And therefore, probably in the therapy room with you, they will be going back to a different self often a younger, traumatised self. Yeah. So the person in front of us may not be what they seem they are. In other words, if we think of ego states, we're more or less going to be either, uh, if we're doing the developmental work I'm talking about, um, meeting their younger self or their unconscious self many year, years ago, or we might bump along or meet their grandfather, parent, significant other person, which has come into the therapy. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say nothing's what it seems in the therapy process. Yeah. Because often the other role of the therapist is to be a what I call a decoder, to help decode what the th what the client is attempting to tell you but often is unable to tell you because they're not or don't have access to that or ego state at that particular developmental time yeah see this is where i think it gets interesting because if we're a decoder and we're decoding mm -hmm. we've got to be really mindful of assumptions and again bringing our past and our history into things if we're reading between the lines potentially we can be quite biased about that absolutely and one golden rule of mine that i've developed as a therapist is as much as i can to move away from assumptions 
Yeah. So some assumptions take us down the wrong road usually. So as much as I can do that, I will. And what I nearly always end the transaction up with to the client is if I make a statement or something which you might want to call an assumption, I'll say, is this how you see it? Yeah. Yeah, now, me too. I know they I know they can over adapt to that, by the way. Yeah. However, that's usually how I end up transactions if I'm going to make a statement about what I see reality is. That doesn't mean I don't or I'm not aware that they may be adapting, but at least I think out of courtesy, out of integrity, and also what you're talking about, to attempt to move away from assumptions, that's a good um, way to end a transaction with a client. Yeah. To yeah. check I things out with them. Totally agree. To, to check in or to check out with them, that's what I tend to do a lot of the time, or just something simple like, is this what you mean? Or is this what you were thinking? What, whatever it is, yeah. Because you have hit on something which is almost vital in psychotherapy. For effective psychotherapy, I think, um, is to is to, and it's very very hard to do, uh, but to, you know, move away the therapist. I mean, to move away from assumptions. Yeah. Now. When you, I mean decoding, yeah, what I mean by is decoding their script or the enactment of their script. Okay. Because they are often at a, such a young place that they're unable to have the access to their, adult, their older adult, which they need to do to be able to get over to you what the hurt is all about or the trauma or whatever we want to talk about it. So I have to check out and say, is this is is this true or is this what you're saying to me? Or could it be this way? Or tell me a little bit more about that. And do that repetitively. Yeah. And sometimes that can take a while dependent on whereabouts they are in the ego states. Because depending on how early it is where, where they've gone to, they might not even be able to put things into words. It might just be feelings that they're having as opposed to being able to, to put it into words and explain it. Yes, absolutely. The further you go down the onion, onion layer or the years, yeah, um, you get to usually a younger place where verbal language gets in the way and then we're in the land of what i would call somatic responses yeah have you ever had a situation with a client where they're not sure whether it's a reality or a memory yes 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 many times and what and, do you say to that oh i i well i nearly always say let's go with how you see it. Yeah, that's kind of like what I say. I, well, I'm a bit more blunt than you, Bob, as you know. I say, does it does it matter whether mm. it was reality or or a memory that you've got? And if that memory isn't mm. factually correct, mm. if, if that's what you're feeling right now, then that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. You see, what you're talking about is false memories. Yeah. False memory syndrome, which... Well, if we go back a few years, um, there was a lot written about this and a lot talked about this. And it, it used to be quite a vogue in sort of therapeutic parlours. And there was a lot more noise about what you're talking about, false memory syndrome. I come from where you come from, by the way, which is, uh, I perhaps don't say does it matter, but I could, it's a good way to say it. I wanted to be more. But I will only always say, well, let's just go with your frame of reference and we'll sort everything out later. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. So exactly where you come from. Yeah. I just find it really interesting that sometimes at that point, clients will question themselves that is it is it a reality? 
Yes, because often the reality is too frightening for them to bear. Yeah. So they yeah. don't. So that it's too overwhelming, too frightening, too un understandable. So it's they will come often from the place that you come from. Yeah. And also, there's a desire that I think there's a conflict often between the younger self and where you are at the moment. Talk about false memory syndrome. Part of them doesn't want their memories to be true. Absolutely. And then there's another part that knows from a much younger instinctual place that it is true. Yeah. And you have this battle going out. And often, if, if, if we're talking about, you know, trauma, abuse here, things where false memories are often created or not, um, may later down the road get played out in psychosis. In other words, they don't want these memories to be true. They're too they're undesirable. They're too painful. They cannot, in inverted commas, be true, question mark. And the other side, which knows at some level that the these this trauma did happen, and then you've got this conflict uh, uh, going on. Then you might get a third part of the self, which often is might be a parent or significant other that hasn't protected them or whatever in the first place, which is also, um, yeah, passing on destructive me uh, messages about it's a secret or whatever language you want to use. Um, and then as a way of coping with all, all that, they are often become psychotic. Mm. In other words, if we take a definition of psychosis as a movement away from reality, they attempt to move away from reality and create a more desirable reality rather than, 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 than going towards this conflict we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a survival mechanism. It's a, yeah, yeah. I think psychosis, by definition, is a survival mechanism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I think once, if if the client comes to the the decision or the conclusion that you know what the memories are are real, then the next thing is. They need to do something with it. <laughs> Whereas... oh, well, well, sorry, carry that on and I'll come back. Yeah, no, well, but... I was just going to say often, potentially, that's why they don't want to accept that their memories are real because it's kind of not real, if that makes sense. And, and if it does become real, then the impact of that can be big. Well, it's usually, it's usually tremendously big in that. Yeah. Way. Yeah. And often will take if they <laughs> they manage to go down that path um after years and years and years of denial or whatever frame we want to use here, they often need a lot of protection, support and long term therapy to take ownership of their real memories. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's like you say, it's kinda of like opening a Pandora's box because it's not just one thing. <laughs> that it happened, then, you know, there's all the unanswered questions about why did nobody save me? Why did nobody listen? Why did nobody know? There's, there's like a, a, a catalogue of things that then potentially the client needs to look at. Yeah, so usually how this all pans out at a major or minor level is when the client um, walks through the therapist's door at the beginning, they don't go straight to what we're talking about here. No, no. it's way down the line. Yeah. They might come with something like, well, you know, I, I, I've been depressed a lot of the time and I'm never quite sure why I'm. But actually, it's, actually, I don't know why I'm here because it's it's low mood, really. Uh, but I just thought I'd come to therapy. And then you go down. So people start off with a very different objective, even if even they don't know why they come to therapy in the first place. So this, what you're talking about here, um, you know, nothing is what it seems in therapy. Yeah. Exactly into the realms of this podcast. 
it needs a so Sherlock Holmes to sorry, we need the therapist to be like a Sherlock Holmes character who asks lots and lots of curiosity questions and um comes from a very protective, supportive place um to get to perhaps a place which is a different type of reality, which would be which could be miles away from what they presented at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think that happens quite a lot is, you know, six months in, something will come up and it's not what, I've got a form that clients fill out, you know, what are you hoping to get out of, you know, seeing a therapist? And it, it's never what comes up further down the line. No. And, you know, to get to the places we're talking about it here, it needs a specific type of psychotherapist which is trained in a specific way. Number one, they need to start thinking developmentally. Because nothing is what it seems in the therapy room once you start thinking developmentally. Yeah. Um, and he's a therapist that, which is prepared to go the extra mile, I think. And he's a therapist that will believe and support the client in front of them. And needs a therapist is going to have a lot of courage to go to where they need to, the client needs to go to. Yeah. And he needs a therapist is well trained in all this. You read my mind then, because I was going to say it's not only having the courage to go there, it's knowing that you've got the skills to go there, or if you go there, yeah, absolutely. And um, that's why I run an assessment system at my institute where I can get the right therapist to go with the right client uh, and all those things. But being trained to be a developmental psychotherapist and then to know or to have the skills and know what to do then when they get to a different place that they're going to with the client um takes time to just get trained in the first place yeah yeah and and then you know it's it's years of experience in it, having the you know the practical skills and learning about it mm -hmm. and and uh, absolutely and on another Another aspect of this conversation which I'd like to bring in, uh, which is this aspect. For the client, the therapist is rarely, rarely what they think they are. In other words, we live in the world of projections. Mm. So the client, when they enact out their script with the therapist, will project onto the therapist how the therapist uh, needs to be to fit into their script and how they see the world. That's what I mean. It's not just about uh, the therapist staying an adult, which we talked about a moment ago, which yeah. hopefully is half the story or more than half the story, but the client, however in adult the therapist is, as we were saying on this podcast, that, doesn't stop in any form or shape the client projecting their script and making the therapist fit into their script to make sense of the world yeah which is really difficult because there's nothing we can do about that <laughs> no we can I'm... respond to it when we know what's going on but we can't force or make anybody think no. of us in any particular way no but or stroke and i believe a developmental based psychotherapist and certainly i'll speak for myself here wants that to happen so if we take as read that the client needs to project onto the therapist that the therapist is a certain type of person right, to support their script, yeah. then the therapist is halfway there because they're already thinking that way. Because if the therapist is always thinking that this is going to occur and that the transference is going to happen, then the therapist is halfway there in creating that help in creating that narrative to yeah. find out what all this is about 
and the character the therapist needs to be or is to fit into this whole process that the client needs to play out to get to some form of resolution in the enactment. It's very difficult, Bob. I'm thinking what you're saying is that we kind of need to buy into the script and become part yes. of it yes. so that then we understand yes. it and we can step out yes. of it and potentially yes. encourage them to follow us or something. Encourage, I don't, yeah. no, encourage the script to develop in the therapy room. Yes. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I wouldn't say buy into, but I like I know what you mean. Well, I'll put a more clinical word, word to it then, that the therapist is able and skillful enough and aware enough to step into the transference. Yes. Yeah. That the client has begun. Yeah, that's that's a much better way than I put it. <laughs> but I kind of knew what, mm, what you, I meant. you were saying. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Now, that takes a certain type of skill by the therapist and it isn't someone that type of step that what we're talking about here stepping in the transference oh god the first year second year third year training or training um therapist isn't likely to be able to do that so the first step is to train the beginning therapist to at least understand the process of transference and script enactment. Yeah. And when they go on their beginning journey and working in placements or whatever it is with their, their new clients, they are starting to think that way. Yeah. And eventually, 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 they might think about whether they want to understand the transference, let the transference play out, or in fact step into the transference. Yes. And that takes time. Yeah, yeah. To learn how to do that. But the first step is to be aware of the process and that it's happening. Absolutely. I think the first step of anything is to, is awareness. Mm. But, you know, I think as well that, there's a, you know, the really important thing around all of that is grounding ourselves as much as the client after something like that has happened in a session. Oh, and that we need to take care of ourselves if if we're doing that and, and understanding that we're stepping into the transference that potentially there's going to be an impact on us with that as well. Well, you you absolutely right, but that leads us to that phrase I said earlier on the podcast in transaction analysis language, executive adult. Yeah. And that, what I mean by this that we that we uh, utilize our energy to stay in the adult state in, you know from where we are today 73 year old so we stay there if you like but like we move another you think of us stepping into another well though we stay grounded in the adult we from executive place we step into like you imagine making a step into their world but we're always grounded in the our executive adult so we can step back again yeah i know i say this quite a lot in a lot of the podcasts that we do but it is literally like the matrix in the therapy room there are so many different levels and intertwining things and and it's yeah it's like the matrix well but if we if i'll go back because i think this is really important if we at least keep more than 70 percent of our energy grounded in our executive adult then we can all then we have that ability to shuttle backwards and forwards into the world of our clients in a protective supportive way and come back again yeah and that's really important that's why i said more than 70 percent because that means at least one of the two people in the room is grounded yeah and able to help the client come back to in an integrated way as much as possible to their adult 
to be able to do the debriefing and making sure they're in their adult ego state before the session ends. Yeah. Yeah, which I think is really important. I can remember on my training as well, I, I might have the, the statistics wrong on this and correct me if I do, but there was something about the 80-20 rule about the type of clients that we take on. Do you know what I mean? That we can't take on every complex client that there is. We need to look after ourselves purely and simply because of things like this that can happen in the therapy room. Well, I think, yeah, that was written in a book called Transaction Analysis by Williams and, was it Williams and Brown? I don't think, maybe it was, when they came out with that, the phrase that you taught there. I think it's very important that we think, if we're taking care of ourselves, that we think about how much energy we have. Yeah. And how much we will spend with certain types of clients. And the more disturbed clients often take more energy, if you want to put it that way. So. Yeah. We, we we need to think about ourselves when we're working with people. So I know ending, so I just wanted to get, oh, I, that's my assumption, but I want us to say something. We addressed this title. Nothing is what it seems in the therapy room. And I believe that. But, or stroke and, it's really, really important that the therapist in the last five, ten minutes makes sure that the client, as much as they are, is in their own adult ego state and the therapist is in their adult ego state. So maybe in the last five minutes of the therapy session and perhaps the first five minutes of the therapy sessions were, were more... Um, they were, what we think is happening is actually happening. Yes. The bit in between may be a different journey. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a nice way of looking at it, that we're in reality at the beginning and at the end and the bit in the middle. Could be anything. Yeah, and, and be open to that. Because oh. Oh. I think that I, I don't plan sessions anymore. I, I don't think you can. But I'm much more open to going where the therapy goes now. When When I first started, I needed a plan so that I knew what was happening, whereas now I don't. I think, though, I, I understand what you're saying exactly, but I think it's a good working rule to think that, if, okay, if we don't plan anything, but at least we know that the beginning and the end of the therapy hour is going to be two people coming from the adult league estates as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. And obviously that the session is in the best interest of the client and not just because I don't want to plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Bob, as always, another wonderful podcast episode. And what we're going to be talking about in the next one is the importance of continuity and predictability in the therapy process. It sort of fits in in a way, doesn't it? I was just thinking that. Yeah, absolutely. Until next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.